Hello guys, my name is Anna and as you know I vlog daily from Ukraine since the start of the brutal Russian invasion. But as this war continues we have to think more and visualize our future victory and the world after this war. I have a lot of questions and I want to ask these questions uh, because that helps me think and I hope it will help you too. And today I'm extremely happy to invite to our conversation Jake Bro, who is a true friend of Ukraine, a very fantastic YouTube vlogger, but also a United States Air Force veteran who has like the experience and I greatly value everything you do for Ukraine, Jake. I follow your videos. I am sure that like all of my subscribers are subscribed to your channel, but if not, please do because Jake tells a lot and does it very professionally and with love and respect to Ukraine. Hello, Jake. Happy to see you. Good to see you too as well, Anna. Um, love and respect to you as well. For any of my subscribers watching this podcast, I'll share it on the community tab. You should be subscribed to Anna as well. She needs to hit uh, 100,000 to get that silver play button. So. Let's see if we can make that happen in the next month or so. That would be awesome. Honestly, of course, I follow this <clears throat> dream too because I believe uh, more people has to know about the things happening in Ukraine and the more of us talk about that, the more attention we attract because this war continues. And as it continues, like uh, some people can get tired and that's not what we want. Uh, I've told um, myself, like, I follow your videos uh, very attentively and some or at least parts of some answers to my first question I already know because I watched your videos from the beginning, but I will ask it uh, because maybe some of our viewers don't know and maybe your perspective has changed a little bit. Um, taking into account your military experience, uh, did you believe that full-scale war with Russia, started by Russia in Ukraine, is possible? Uh, because for me, it seemed as something unrealistic, very irrational, very illogical. So did you believe it is possible? And if the answer is yes, then was it possible to avoid it somehow or to be better prepared for Ukraine and for the world? So that's a two-part question. The first part, did I think it was possible? The second one, was it avoidable? So let's try and hit both of those. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I've talked about my time as a missileer in the Air Force for six years. Uh, Russia has 6,000 nuclear warheads. The United States has like 5,500. Uh, my job was nuclear weapons. <laughs> so given what <laughs> I did, yeah, you think about Russia a lot because the United States only maintains thousands of nuclear warheads because Russia does it as well. And when I was in the job doing the job, I just assumed this was the balance of power, that this was this permanent stalemate between two strategic adversaries and nothing would come of it. The Cold mm -hmm. War went, uh, you know, from 1945 <laughs> until... Uh, 1991 and the Soviet Union and the United States never went to nuclear war. There were proxy wars, uh, Korea and Vietnam, Afghanistan, but uh, never a direct confrontation between the two. So when I was sitting underground uh, on alert, maintaining and operating and supervising our nation's nuclear weapons, I said to myself, we're never going to use these. Mm -hmm. Russia's never going to do anything. Mm -hmm. Why would Russia ever do anything? All those guys are getting rich. <laughs> you know, the uh, the vast resources, the oil and gas fields, the gold mines, the coal, everything that Russia has. All you have to do is participate in, you know, the, the global economic system. Capitalism gets you rich mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, just set it on autopilot. Why would we ever go back to the age of empires where you want to invade your neighbor, subjugate them, commit genocide, and pretend like this is normal in, in the 21st century? So when I was doing my job, 
I had kind of cynicism to it because I said, mm -hmm. we're a relic of the Cold War. We're a holdout. We're a, what's the word, uh, you know, an appendage that isn't necessary for the United Anymore. States' strategic uh, objectives. Uh, and I got out of the Air Force in February of 2022. Symbolic. Literally like a week later, Russia invaded Ukraine. And on my YouTube channel, I was talking about it. I, I made a video, just a one-off, giving my perspective and leading up to the invasion. I, I said, I don't think Russia's going to do this. This would be incredibly stupid. <laughs> How can an invasion force of 200,000 soldiers subjugate and conquer a nation of 40 million people actively resisting like the numbers just didn't make sense and the obvious answer is that russia couldn't do it <laughs> they yeah. assumed ukraine's government would flee they they assumed the ukrainian military would stand down they assumed the ukrainian people would accept russification and just be absorbed into putin's new vision of what the russian empire is so your second part was this avoidable? <laughs> and that's a trick question. Yes, it was avoidable if the Ukrainian people just accepted subjugation, if they gave up on the right to self-determination and being a free and independent country. Okay, yeah, the war was avoidable. But if Ukraine wanted real democracy, if Ukraine wanted closer ties to the European Union, no. Only one person got a vote in this war. And that was mm -hmm. Vladimir Putin. Yeah. He is the only person that made the decision that this was going to happen. And I believe over the last eight or nine years, Putin just convinced himself that this was going to be easy. Uh, I can't remember. I think it was Anders Puck Nielsen who told me this. I, I asked mm -hmm. him, why did Russia invade Ukraine? And he said the number one reason is Putin thought it would be easy. Mm -hmm. If Putin knew what was going to happen the last, uh, you know, year and a half. I don't think he would have done it. But Putin spent 23 years consolidating power, uh, eliminating political rivals, eliminating anyone younger that could potentially replace him. Uh, anybody who challenged him was exiled, killed, or imprisoned. And anyone who fed him information he didn't like best case scenario, you got fired, <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. but you weren't going to be giving him information anymore. So Putin was only being told what he wanted to hear. And he was told, yeah, this will be a three day special military operation. President Zelensky is a comedian. Uh, as, as soon as the tanks roll in, he'll flee. Mm -hmm. The country won't have a government. We'll take the capital city. The military and the Donbass regional stand down. Easy peasy. Yeah, uh, sometimes there's censorship and propaganda. They play a really um, hard trick on those who produce them. They start believing their own myths, losing connection to reality, and thus starting uh, the war. Uh, Honestly, I have to confess that when it all began, I also had a feeling of like, well, finally the world sees the true face of Russia. And uh, I was, and I'm still very grateful for all the support that we receive from people, from countries. Uh, but I had this optimistic feeling that maybe this full-scale war will take um, a month or two months and everything will be over. It's really difficult to imagine living through a year and seven months already and now we all realize it's not going to happen to stop uh, tomorrow because this is a really big war and the size of destruction and the number of people involved is really difficult to comprehend sometimes. Um, have you what what have you noticed what changes have you noticed in the character of this war because like Putin had to adjust to this reality that he did not manage to um, get Kiev in three days uh, Ukrainian armed forces had to adjust and people had to adjust to new realities um, have you noticed the changes in the character of this war? Are there any positive, negative signs that maybe we don't see from inside, like the system inside the situation? So once again, uh, kind of a two-part question. I first want to talk about 
optimism in the beginning that this would be over in a week or a month. Uh, and then the second part is how has the war changed? Uh, if you go back and look at the videos I made that first week, that first month, I actually, I think the pinned comments are all still there. I was saying the, reg the regular Russian people need to understand what is happening in Ukraine, and then they will hold their government accountable. Mm -hmm. That was my mistake. I just <laughs> assumed that Russia, you know, it, 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 there's a lot of corruption. Putin managed to change the constitution and become president for life. But I still assumed the Russian people were good people, and if they just saw the pictures and videos of what their military was doing, they would put a stop to it. Two months into the war, I gave up on the Russian people. I said, these people are accepting it. They're, they're fine with it. Many think it's a great thing that, you know, Ukraine is being destroyed and civilians are being targeted. I forget who said it, but... Somebody said, you know, when you see Russians, it's unfortunate that they look European because there's nothing about them that's European. You know, it, it would be easier to comprehend Russians if they were purple, if you just <laughs> saw them as a completely different species. They um, are. The, uh, the expression, what is Russia's greatest strength? And it's that their people suffer well, that they're willing to tolerate corruption and uh, brutality and... Uh, you know, people living in Siberia, just abject poverty as the wealth and resources of their communities are harvested and sent to the oligarchs in Moscow and St. Petersburg. So I assumed that this would be over fast, that the people of Russia would put a stop to it. A year and a <laughs> half later, I was completely wrong. I didn't understand the Russian people. I have a better understanding of them now. So number two, how has the war changed? And um, the Russian people are accepting it. The Russian people are supporting it. Uh, their sons and husbands and fathers are going off to war and being butchered by Western weapons in trenches in Ukraine. And it's a question of where's the breaking point? I think we'll talk more about this, but... Uh, well, we'll get we'll get to Russia's collapse potential, but uh, I don't accept the narrative that this is going to be a long war. I don't mm -hmm. accept the narrative that this is a new normal, you know, mm -hmm. attrition oh, rates no. for Western equipment, Ukrainian soldiers and Russians. I, I, I think we're going to get to an inflection point probably in the next six months. Mm -hmm. I think as we go into December and January, this will be Russia's third winter of this war and their troops are not being cared for. They're not getting enough calories to eat, especially when it's cold. They're not getting clean drinking water. They don't have proper cold weather gear. All of Ukraine's superior technology as far as thermal sites and that kind of stuff are going to light up like crazy in the wintertime. GLSDB is arriving. Abrams tanks with depleted uh, uranium is arriving. F-16s are coming next spring. Attackums are on the way. It just keeps getting worse and worse for Russia. And despite uh, the good face that the Kremlin propaganda machine puts on, uh, it's it's going to get only worse from this point. And last week, the Black Sea headquarters was just blown up. <laughs> I like it a lot. And thank you for saying this, because there is a lot of information about let's prepare for this long war and from one point of view I do understand it's not a quick process but behind every day these are human lives these are uh, territories that are destroyed so for us it's not just about being patient and like focusing on other stuff it's just about real lives human lives so I do like uh, the idea that it might be sooner and I share um, the feeling that nothing will come out of Russian population. I will not use the word society because actually they could have influence somehow, but it's really terrifying that they treat this uh, perspective to be mobilized and to die in Ukraine, to loot as a normal perspective of their life. Uh, 
on that note, I just want to add, it, it's nationalism. What Putin and, and the Russians have done is just cranked up this nationalist fervor to the max. Mm -hmm. And everyone wants to be proud of who they are and where they were born. Uh, every nation in the world is susceptible to nationalists, populists, who say, you were born in this country, our country is superior to other countries, you should want to support me because I'm the leader of your nation. Mm -hmm. And so I think, you know, the way a lot of Russian soldiers continue carrying on is they don't agree with the war, they might not even like Putin, but they were born Russian and that's the team they were born on and they just feel like they need to keep playing the game because then you would have to destroy your own identity to say, I as a Russian, born a Russian, we're the bad guys, <laughs> you know, yes, we're doing this wrong. <laughs> I, I understand that, that gravitation of, I don't want to admit that my core identity is, is, yeah. is evil. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, but once again, there's got to be an inflection point and it'd be great if entire units at some point just started surrendering. It would be great. Uh, by the way, they have lots of work to do inside Russia. One of my subscribers had this command. They could have just turned and walked to Kremlin, and that's the place where all the problems are, uh, Russian problems and the level of their society. Uh, Jake, um, I know that, like, you, you have just said that, that at the very beginning you believed Russian people will interfere and um, many people saw the real face of Putin's regime of Russia because back in 2014 it was still possible to close the eyes, to pretend that nothing really happened um, during, for example, the annexation of Crimea. Now it was impossible. Um, how has this war changed the world in general? Um, have you noticed any serious things, positive or negative? Because even the outcome of this war is very important for future uh, of the planet. Um, do you see these changes? Ultimately, the reason why communism failed and the Soviet Union failed is because the West was much wealthier. Mm -hmm. uh, I, despite the lack of political freedoms and the consolidation of power in Russia, I think Western leaders believed if we can just get Russia rich mm -hmm. through capitalism, then they'll just be part of the global economic order. You know, mm -hmm. if, if everyone's getting rich, rich, why would you destroy that balance of power? So I do believe that Western leaders, the United States policy the last 20 years was let's economically integrate ourselves with Russia. Mm -hmm. Let's make them dependent on us. Let's get dependent on them because nations that trade together don't go to war with each other. Mm. So the belief was, uh, which I think is broken, uh, is that you can do business with dictators, President Xi in China, Putin in Russia. You can you can economically integrate with with them, and that will prevent future wars. We're wrong. That entire political Very model wrong. has been destroyed, and we're seeing that now happen between the United States and China. Um, President Xi is a dictator who. Everyone in China has gotten rich the last 20 years, uh, and they're using that money to build up their military, to threaten their neighbors in the South Pacific, to threaten Taiwan. So a lot of these economic ties that we've built with China the last 20 years are being severed uh, with semiconductors and manufacturing. Fortune 500 companies are desperately trying to pull their capital and resources out of China to bring it back to North America. It doesn't have to go to the United States. It can go to Mexico or, or, or maybe South America, but they just need to get off the Asian continents because all the signals coming from China is that things are going to get bad in the next 10 years. Same is true for Russia. Uh, with Nord Stream pipeline, all these pipelines, uh, the theory was economically integrate with Russia, make them rich, and this will prevent wars. But Putin took all that money we gave him, rebuilt his military, and then decided he wanted to 
He wanted to invade all the former Soviet republics mm -hmm. and reconstitute the Russian Empire. If Putin had succeeded in Ukraine, he wouldn't have stopped. He would have gone for the Baltics. He would have obviously gone for Moldova, Kazakhstan. The wars, this is still a, a potential, but the wars will never end unless somebody puts a stop to Putin. Yeah, that is a very important message. Putin will not stop. He has to be stopped. And uh, this is not just about Ukraine. This is about a very big region that Putin sees as his uh, empire, as this monstrous combination of Russian Empire and Soviet Union. What is very unusual for me about Russia is that they combine uncombinable, this like uh, sadness and nostalgia for communism and they depict Stalin on icons and that is chaos like they combine uh, uncombinable do you think like this um, understanding of what Russia is and what Russian people are and this very specific Ruski Mir doctrine uh, this understanding has come to many people all over the world or do they uh, still believe? because often we are pushed to negotiate uh, to um, communicate, but you do not negotiate with people who came to kill you, uh, with true terrorists that threaten world order, not just Ukraine. So I'm, I'm 39, and I barely remember what the world was like in the 1980s. Mm. But for older people, uh, most of my YouTube audience is older than me, uh, mm -hmm. They remember the threat of the Soviet Union and communism and the Russians. If you've watched uh, Stranger Things on Netflix, you know, the, the villains in season three or four or whatever, it's the Russians because yeah. the story takes place in the 1980s. <clears throat> but given that the Soviet Empire collapsed, there was this period of bygones begot bygones in the 1990s. All was forgiven as long as Russia gave up their imperial aspirations we're gonna kind of forget and ignore all the terrible things the russians did in the past mm -hmm. uh but given what putin is doing today putin being a former kgb officer a, a product of the soviet machine back in the 70s and 80s he wants to go back he wants to rewind the clock he stated that the collapse of the Soviet Union was the greatest geopolitical disaster of the 20th century. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think there is this reawakening. Uh, when you look at on, on social media and YouTube, the people who are pro-Russian living in the West, they're all young people. They're people in their 20s and 30s. Uh, these propagandists who think that the West is corrupt and decadent Rotting. and decaying, but, but they have no memory of mm -hmm. the Soviet Union or, or, or what the Russians did in the, the 40s, 50, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. Uh, but yeah, it's the older generations that remember and are wise. Uh, and eventually, Russia's narrative of everyone in Ukraine is a Nazi and they're the good guys somehow, it's, it's not going to hold. History will set the record straight. Hindsight is twenty twenty. Everything that Russia has done the last year and a half will be codified, solidified, <laughs> calcified mm -hmm. in the minds of the world. And Russia's reputation is, is irre ir irreversibly damaged. If you're a Russian citizen and you, you want to have a peaceful vacation, you can go to Pyongyang in North Korea because that's the yeah. only place where people are going to be nice to you. <laughs> yeah, tell me who your friend is and I'll tell you who you are. And now we see the um, friends of Putin uh, and how this circle actually narrows. Um, honestly, sometimes I wish those people who support Russia now uh, especially the young generation, to simply travel to Russia and spend some time living in one of its cities, not Moscow, not St. Petersburg, but Russia is big, and enjoy this Ruski Mir and then um, think oh, again <laughs> whether it's okay or not. And uh, you have so beautifully described all the steps that um, 
Western democracy is made to try and cooperate with Russia, believing that some normal things like trade, like traveling, I don't know, communications can lead to a further normalization of their society. But what we see as steps of friendship, as a way to solve a potential conflict, Russia sees as weakness. It acts as a typical bully, as a typical terrorist, and any normal step is seen as something like weakness. And especially, uh, it's especially interesting to hear your answer because you know what nuclear weapons is, you served in that like atmosphere. And uh, now many people are afraid that Putin at a certain moment will use nuclear weapons. And very often, even Ukrainians are stopped from some steps not to escalate. I personally hate this advice because I believe a victim cannot escalate. It's only an aggressor who escalates. Like you cannot escalate while protecting yourself from a murderer. Uh, but still, this is a very popular argument, especially among politicians. Let's not escalate because Putin will use nuclear weapons. Do you think this is a correct tactics in such situation and with such dictator as Putin? Well, that, that narrative, if you escalate, we will use nuclear weapons, is verbatim what Putin has been saying and, and, and the Russian media has been saying since day one. The second day of the war, Putin raised his equivalent of the DEFCON of his nuclear forces. He's the one on day mm -hmm. two or day three of his special military mm -hmm. operation who mm -hmm. escalated. And by the way, I don't think he's ever lowered uh, the state of readiness of his nuclear forces in a year and mm -hmm. a half. Mm -hmm. uh, but as far as what is the real threat of Russia using a nuclear weapon, I made a like a 30 minute video outlining like eight different reasons why Russia can't and won't use nuclear weapons. The short answer is economic. India and China, the other nuclear powers, don't want Russia to use nuclear weapons, and they could potentially participate in economic sanctions. That would be a death blow. Mm -hmm. The other one is NATO would get involved. Uh, Russia is losing this war to just Ukraine, mm -hmm. and not a single NATO soldier has fired a shot yet. Uh, Russia knew that NATO was never going to attack Russia because they're wasting their stockpile of strategic long-range missiles. They're pulling troops off NATO borders to redeploy them to Ukraine. Russia has no fear of ever being attacked by NATO because they have 6,000 nuclear weapons. But if they use one of those 6,000 nuclear weapons in their war of aggression out of convenience, because their conventional military is terrible, mm -hmm. then yeah, uh, there would be a NATO response. The NATO response would not be nuclear, by the way. It would be conventional, but it'd be something very severe. Additionally, if Putin uses a nuclear weapon, he's dead. He's going to yeah. have to go underground and then never leave that compound because... A drone with a Hellfire missile would be waiting for his motorcade. <laughs> so he knows that if he uses a nuclear weapon, he's a dead man. Um, because the only reason why the West isn't assassinating him is because he hasn't used a nuclear weapon. <laughs> so there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of uh, catch-22s here when it comes to nuclear strategy and, and, and uh, what's, it, what's the word, uh, game theory. Mm-hmm. So, what was the question? What were, what were we originally well, talking about? Uh, is it oh, like he uses this threat uh, to of escalation. prevent us from some serious actions? I don't know. Well, uh, you know, the analogy people use is it's like putting a frog in water and boiling it. Yeah. You know, the, if you do it slowly, the frog doesn't even notice. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I saw on the YouTube channel reporting from Ukraine what Ukraine's own strategy was when mm -hmm. using these Storm Shadow and Scalp cruise missiles. First mm -hmm. thing they did is they went after the bridges uh, that connect Crimea to uh, the mainland. Mm -hmm. 
And they wanted to see, what's Russia going to do? We're technically using Western weapons to bomb Crimea. We're blowing up those bridges. What's Russia's response? Nothing. All right, let's go a little bit deeper into Crimea and blow up some air defense systems and some uh, air bases. What's uh, Russia's response? We're using Western weapons to attack Crimea. They said that was a red line. Mm -hmm. Nothing. Mm -hmm. Let's wait a couple weeks. And then, sure enough, they're now bombing Sevastopol, yeah. which, you know, is supposed to be a Pearl Harbor moment that triggers World War III. <laughs> yeah. And Russia's not doing nothing. What's Russia's response? They can't do anything more than they're currently doing. Yeah, that's very important to see that and uh, to understand that because like many people are waiting this super dynamic counteroffensive, but it can take different uh, shapes and forms. And honestly, at the very beginning, I thought like Crimea might be the last thing that we will liberate. And now I'm very optimistic seeing the results of Ukrainian strategy uh, there. I think the cities of uh, Donetsk and Luhansk will be the last. Mm -hmm. Russia's going to have to pull out of the Donbass region for Ukraine to retake that. But given the geography of Crimea, they're not getting mm -hmm. any more fresh water. And <laughs> I, think, uh, I think Ukraine is going to blow up their uh, power plants going into this winter. Mm -hmm. They're going to make sure that Crimea doesn't have electricity or fresh water. They're already telling everyone, just leave, mm -hmm. leave the yeah. peninsula. If you're, if you support Ukraine and you're in Crimea, get out because we're going to make this region, uh, <laughs> unlivable for the Russian military. It's going to get worse. Yeah, and that's important. I do like this uh, humane approach of Ukrainian armed forces that we always warn, we give options, and uh, we are fighting for our territories to get back. Uh, honestly, I watched that video of yours, why Putin will not use nuclear weapons, because from time to time, when situation escalates, you do need some uh, information that can calm you down. And I agree with you that, like, of course, he's not a suicidal maniac. Putin is very much afraid for his health and life. And that one of the main reasons why perhaps he will not nuke. Though he is crazy and irrational. And uh, like, I also did not believe full scale war is possible. So sometimes I have this fears, but, mm, uh, you know, I was even thinking about this Budapest Memorandum and Ukraine giving up nuclear weapons and uh, many people say, oh, that was really stupid. But then from the other perspective, from this like normal human being perspective, it would have been right if many countries repeated the thing Ukraine did, but just like um, if this guarantees of peace were real like so it is not ukraine that is stupid to give up its nuclear weapons but the world is bad that giving up your nuclear weapons is not a good thing to do in it uh you know at the very beginning of this war it was easier to imagine the victory and now i think it's super important to visualize our future victory the day when everything is over but together with this there are lots of questions. What is this victory? What should be treated as victory? Like all territories that return back to Ukraine, um, re reconstruction, rebuilding, Russia paying for all the destructions that it caused, a Putin persecuted in The Hague, uh, or something even more serious. Um, what do you think would be a just victory in this war? I, I, I do think that uh, Russia's military at some point will have a breaking point and they mm -hmm. will uh, pull out of Ukraine's 1991 borders. Mm -hmm. I think this is inevitable that Ukraine will liberate all their territory and retain their sovereignty. As far as war criminals being arrested and held accountable or reparations being paid, that's debatable. Like, mm -hmm. I don't know if that's a guarantee, if that will happen. Uh, I, I think Western governments would want certain individuals turned over and prosecuted and reparations to be paid in exchange for sanctions being lifted. But if, 
you know, the government in Moscow is not coherent <laughs> or, uh, you know, strong or stable or there's nobody that can enforce that kind of stuff. I, I, I mean, we're going to talk about this, but I think Russia's going to break up. Like, I think there's going to be a dozen new countries uh, at the end of this war because the concentration of power in Moscow, this cycle just keeps repeating itself. It's been going for hundreds of years unbroken. The flat Eurasian steps that lead to this consolidation whoever whoever sits on the throne in moscow just does the exact same thing over and over and over again they can't help themselves mm -hmm. so the only way to stop this is to diffuse power break up russia so if russia's broken up and economically they're in bad shape who pays reparations i don't know the 300 billion that's been the 300 billion in frozen mm -hmm. frozen russian assets like Russia shouldn't get that money back. There mm -hmm. needs to be a legal process, but that money should 100% all go to Ukraine when the war is over. I mean, it should go right now, but I understand why they're waiting. Yeah, uh, Ukraine likes to play by the rules, and we always demonstrate that we follow these instructions that our allies give us. So, of course, it all has to be legal and fixed in new laws or anything. But I do like, and thank you for mentioning, like that was one of my questions, the future collapse of Russia. I know many are afraid, uh, same as many were afraid of the collapse of Soviet Union, but um, like it was a very natural process. Well, and... Russia, Russia's using its language as a weapon. They're mm -hmm. saying, oh, you speak Russian? You're Russian. Mm -hmm. You should be part of Russia. Anywhere in the world, anyone is speaking Russian, that's where our borders are and we will use mm -hmm. our military to redraw the lines so anybody speaking russian is part of russia but they're not they're not taking into account the new age the new world order in which we gave up our imperial pasts how many countries in the world speak english we don't mm -hmm. all have to be one country mm -hmm. how many in the world uh, how many countries in the world speak spanish do they all have to be part of Spain? How many countries in the world speak Arabic? Do they all need to be one unified, solid country? So this 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 logic that Russia's government spews out to the world that if anyone speaks Russian, they need to be part of the Russian state. No, it's okay. We can we can have 13, 14, 15 countries where Russia is their primary Russian is their primary language. <laughs> because that's the remnants of their empire, similar to the the British Empire, the Spanish Empire. Yeah. You know. Many did not want to see Russia as an empire because typically the empire has colonies somewhere far away, but Russia was expanding in a different manner. And I think it's because very... the Russians are incompetent and they couldn't build ships. <laughs> if the Russians could build ships, they would have had African colonies like all the other European powers. But because they're so incompetent, they just told their soldiers to walk everywhere. That's my yeah. response to that argument. That's that's a wonderful conversation. That's exactly what I think. And OK, <laughs> right. You're right. Plus. Um, I try to inspire people to see this process of collapse of Russia not as something negative, but as an inspiring liberation of lots of beautiful countries that can grow up and become democratic and their cultures. And once again, Russian was not their native language. They were Russified for hundreds of years and they forgot it. Um, for example, many Russian-speaking regions in Ukraine, they were Ukrainian-speaking a hundred years ago or before Holodomor, which was an artificial famine and genocide against people. They are so traumatized that they lost this connection uh, to their cultural heritage. And uh, this happens all over different countries that are now swallowed by Russia. Not cared for, but just like uh, taken account of. And that might be just a beautiful liberation process, not the dangerous thing that, like, we don't know who will possess nuclear weapons and other stuff that they use. And honestly, your argument that if Russia collapses, I don't know who will pay reparations. 
If I had to choose between Russian collapse and reparations, I would choose Russian collapse because this means that we have safer future. Because every 50 years, every 20 years, Russia produces a new dictator. And as a Ukrainian, I'm personally very much afraid of any kind of frozen conflict or unpunished experience. Like when we have some peace for some period and it is just the regrouping or restructuring of Russian army. Uh, thank you so much for uh, that. And uh, well, you uh, speak a lot about Ukrainian counteroffensive, the operations, Ukrainian people. Uh, but we do need advice also. Ha have you noticed how Ukraine has changed during this war? Do you see some mistakes maybe that we are making? Because I'm personally very afraid of the fatigue that can grow uh, in uh, the world for the support of Ukraine. Uh, because when I interviewed Operator Starsky, he said one quote which is very um, correct, I believe, at war. When you are tired, you are dead. And uh, here we understand that we don't have a right to be tired and uh, we don't want the world to be tired. But what are the good things that you see about Ukraine, Ukrainian armed forces, Ukrainian people, whatever you want to say, and maybe some mistakes or some things that you would like us to advise to do differently? It's hard for me to say anything critical because... You know, given given what Ukraine has faced the last year and a half, in my opinion, they're overperforming. Like, I mean, what they've accomplished is incredible. The regular Russian military on the map has not successfully advanced anywhere in over a year. Mm -hmm. It was the Wagner Group that took Bakhmut and Solidar. Russia's two most competent military leaders were Yevgeny Prigozhin and Dmitry Ukin. And Putin had him assassinated. <laughs> Bye -bye. <laughs> so, so the regular Russian military in over a year has not accomplished anything. Blowing up power transformers and grain silos is not a huge military victory. Russia's entire... I mean, I, I wish I could be in charge of Russia and reuse <laughs> their wish... resources and say, you guys keep making a lot of stupid decisions. Let me be in charge and I could win this war if it was just a game. Mm -hmm. As far as Ukraine, you know, you think about, what do they call it? The menagerie, the zoo of equipment and vehicles and parts and manuals and training. Like, it's so insane. All of the different systems that have been delivered to Ukraine and they just keep outperforming expectations. So as far as what criticism, what, what advice... I'll never understand what it feels like to be Ukrainian because I'm not Ukrainian. The fact that an invading force has come to their land to steal it, to steal their children, to uh, kill their parents, to russify the land, to outlaw their language and culture and national identity. I don't see why Ukraine would ever give up. Like, I don't... I understand you can get tired. I understand emotionally you'll be exhausted and... Everything you have to experience every day is traumatic and horrifying. All I can do as an American on the other side of the world is make these videos, offer my support unconditionally. Um, advice is uh, just keep repeating to yourself that Russia is going to break first. It's a battle of wills. It's a battle of who wants it more. And I you know, you see these drone videos, you see these uh, videos of Russian soldiers complaining and, and, and filming appeals directly to Putin or these intercepted phone calls back to their loved ones in Russia. And they hate this war. They don't understand it. They're being literally told to charge, to advance at the barrel of a gun. And if they retreat, they're shot by their own commanders. That's how Russia's fought wars for hundreds of years, but in the 21st century where we all have iPhones with HD cameras mm -hmm. and microphones, like, Putin doesn't understand it. Like, he doesn't understand yeah. that how you fought wars in the 1800s doesn't work in the year mm -hmm. 2023. And mm -hmm. 
all of this evidence, all of these recordings, all of these videos are on the internet forever. These drone drop videos, these videos of Russian soldiers committing suicide, hanging themselves. This is Russia's legacy, and their people are never going to be free of, of this visual evidence of their own cruelty and barbarity. And as, I mean, it's just horrifying to me. Uh, yeah. I digress. <laughs> it is. I agree. When I realize, like, in what level of evil they live, I cannot understand how is it possible. Uh, we have this inside Ukraine joke that even being bombed and killed, uh, no one of us would want to switch and to become a citizen of any Russian city where it is safe, for example, because of the misery of that life and, like, this is real like hell and I don't know, anything um, you would like not to be in your life. <clears throat> Jake, I would like to thank you very much for all that you do, for the way you feel Ukraine, because being on the other side of uh, the world, you are still very close to us. And honestly, as a Ukrainian, I have to confess this means very much. At the start of this war, we had so many doubts, we did not no, will we manage to withstand because there are always doubts you don't know what will happen next but when we felt this support and that the world cares and the world sees ukraine and understands that it's different that it's fighting for the good it meant really a lot to us and uh, your channel is a very strong voice and a very strong support to us and uh, just personally talking to you, hearing me, some of your perspectives at me strengths, and that happens to hundreds and thousands of people all over the world. So thank you so much for all that you do. I'm here for as long as it takes. Russia is going to lose this war. I've not had a doubt of that since day one of their invasion. Ukraine is incredible. Uh, I hope to visit someday. You have my support forever and always. That's exactly what I wanted to say. I often say it on my channel, but I mean it. I hope the day when it is safe to travel and discover Ukraine comes soon. And you are definitely invited for our victory party, <laughs> but whatever it will be. But I'm sure that will be a very important day. Beach party in Crimea. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> it's a beautiful place and I hope it will change. Good wine, good nature and good people will come there soon and Ukraine will return back to you. Crimea will return back to Ukraine. So let's wait for this day. And once again, thank you so much for agreeing to talk. Thank you for everything that you do. Subscribe to our channels. I will leave all the links below this video. And uh, are you ready? Slava Ukraini! Glory to the heroes! <laughs> Thank you. Um, do you well, think... The, the I'm common, sorry, the... I have a pet. <laughs> I have yeah, a I saw that earlier. That was pretty funny. I'm sure the audience has noticed already, but... Uh, I don't the, know. The com... I was trying to catch it before, then it disappeared, and like, let's treat it as a pet. <laughs> well, let's give, him, let's give him a name. What's, what's his name? Okay, as I plan to kill him later. <laughs> no, that's a fly, so it can be any of, I don't know, <laughs> Russian. Maybe dragon. you can open a window and, and, and give him freedom. <laughs> oh, let's negotiate that later. <laughs> anyway, uh, 